One of the things that I know you, the Primary Care Association, have been working on with a number of health centers is how to make clear to clinicians uh, the emphasis on patient and community well-being, not just the absence of disease and disease symptoms. And the whole approach of uh, intervention to trauma that characterizes uh, uh, some of these efforts uh, is something that I think a lot of us in medicine, as well as in the social sciences and social work and law, uh, have been working on for a long time, at least certainly for all of those of us in those disciplines uh, who are trying to teach students and residents. Uh, and if we need to make clear to them that well-being is something much more than the absence of disease, uh, that leads us almost directly not just to the social determinants of health, uh, but to the consequences of those determinants in the lives of many of our patients. Uh, I talk about social determinants with medical students, uh, and I work my way around to what we now know biologically about chronic stress and what that does to the release of cortisol and other hormones and the resetting of triggers for the fight and flight mechanisms so that you are in a state of alarm and arousal uh, continually. And that sounds pretty abstract. Uh, certainly to mostly middle class and upper middle class medical students. So I then say, how many of you remember taking the SAT or the MCAT? Uh, how you felt when you walked into that room and the blue book was in front of you and everything was going to depend on this. You knew that. And it was all about to begin. Do you remember how you felt? And almost every hand goes up. And then I say, okay, now imagine feeling that way all the time. And they get it. They really get it. And then one can say, let's talk about the things that make people feel that way all the time. And you need to balance that at the same time with something else, because otherwise you end up describing poor and vulnerable people only as sinkholes of pathology of one kind or another. So you have to find examples, and they are manifold, uh, of the resilience uh, of so many people in those populations and the skills that they have developed and the enormous energy uh, that they are in fact putting into survival and uh, into the raising of their children. Uh, the poor are not the salt of the earth. They are almost as diverse as the rest of us, except they're poor. Uh, and they live in communities and institutions that are different from those uh, that most of the people in clinical disciplines and with uh, major administrative and financial skills uh, grew up in. Uh, but not all as we start getting something like the diversity that we need uh, in medical school and college and professional education. Nowhere near where it should be, uh, but better uh, than it used to be. And uh, so we need people who have some grasp of what it means to be faced with an eviction notice, with a utility cut off, uh, with outrageous abuse by an employer, with the consequences of domestic violence. And I think we need to understand this, particularly for children, uh, the kinds of research that in part triggered uh, this trauma intervention program uh, is the research that has started to demonstrate quite clearly that adversity in early childhood 
poverty and extreme poverty in particular in infants and young children really starts to significantly rewire the brain. So we embody poverty in uh, the brain of all places in these kinds of changes. And that has something to do with what we know. Childhood poverty forecasts with near certainty a shorter life, a sicker life, uh, lower uh, occupational and personal achievement, uh, all of those multi-generational problems uh, that continue to afflict not just our population, uh, but uh, marginalized populations all around the world. Uh, and there are ways in which, because we have our institutions, uh, community health centers, we can start to intervene in that.